Okay, in our last chapter, we talked about how we regulate the insurance industry. And within that, we said, all right, well, these are pretty complicated legal documents. So it might be good to dive into kind of what makes them complicated and the primary aspects of the legal principles of an insurance contract. Okay. Now, here are the four that we're going to go over today. And you might notice that you could recognize two, maybe three of these. Okay. We have already covered indemnity, at least in idea. And we're going to iron out the kind of legal principle of that. But that's not new to us. Nor is insurable interest. We, we spoke about, you spoke at length about some of the issues with credit default swaps by calling them insurance, right? Not to say that they're inherently bad products, but by calling them in, insurance, we said, well, there's a problem because an outside investor can purchase a credit default swap with no insurable interest. Okay, so now we'll talk from a legal perspective why that's a problem. And it's a little outside of just moral hazard. Then subrogation, this might be new to us. I know we haven't discussed it in this class, so this, this could be new to you. Okay, so subrogation basically just means that the insurance company is going to act on your behalf. Okay, and there, there's some pros and cons to that, but that's what we get. And the fine, final one here, utmost good faith, is admittedly a bit archaic, um, and we'll talk about the history of that as we get into it, but it's still, it's still important. Okay, it's still important. Okay. All right, so let's dive into indemnity. Okay, so recall that one of our, our kind of primary definition was to make whole, right? Because indemnify means to make whole. And we further identified that by saying, okay, but, but really what would happen in a contract here is that an individual would be brought up almost to, but no more than their original financial position. Okay. So from the insurance perspective, the insurance company, they're not going to pay more than the actual amount of loss. And that's pretty simple to see because it's a huge moral hazard issue. If I have a personal auto policy, and for some reason I know that they're overvaluing my vehicle by 20 or 30 percent, even with the deductible, that's gambling then. There's no longer a pure risk. I know I could get a higher payout. So it is to prevent from prof profiting and or creating moral hazard. So these are not mutually exclusive here. They could, in fact, be um, very, very much related. Okay. And, and keep in mind, again, with our definition of moral hazard, sometimes when you think of moral hazard or adverse selection, especially in something like a, a health insurance market, we want to immediately associate that as a negative connotation to, let's say, potential you know individuals looking for a health insurance policy. But really, it's just an academic definition of behavior. Okay, we're not saying that these people are bad people. Another way to think about it is they're responding to incentives. Okay, so yes, if you have a pre-existing condition, it's there's an adverse selection issue there. There could be. Okay. But does that make you a bad person? Absolutely not. Yeah. It could be that you could see that you profit from an insurance contract. Does it make you a bad person because you want to profit? In and of itself, I would argue no. Okay, so keep in mind, we'll discuss more hazard and adverse selection more throughout this chapter in the future. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, we're not saying anything negative about individuals. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind. So with all this, to make sure that there's no profit, we have to be able to discern a fair value so that we're not paying, the insurance company is not paying more for the product. So how can we do that? Well, a couple of ways. The first we could do replacement costs. We look at the books, okay, and how much has that asset depreciated? Machinery, equipment, some, some vehicles for sure. Now with a vehicle you probably wouldn't want straight line depreciation because most new vehicles have a pretty hard depreciation the first year or two or three or four, and then slowly kind of flatten out. So it could be basically from an accounting perspective. Now we'll see in the next slide a different type of replacement cost insurance. Or we'll, we'll show how it might not fit with a true cash value of something. Okay, but really we're this from an accounting perspective here. Fair market value. Let's say that instead of looking to depreciate and on that vehicle, that's a good example, we could look up, you know, Kelly Blue Book, Cars.com, Auto Trader, and see, all right, that's about fair market value. So maybe that less the deductible. Now, combining these two, or using all of the information available to us, we would call that, or one phrase for that is the broad evidence rule. Okay. This might be particularly important with something that could bring us cash flows in the future. 
because we're losing out. There's an indirect cost from that. If we lose something that's making us money, perhaps it's worth more than the book value, right? We could get an appraisal, but something that requires appraisal, we might want to see like a value policy. So what is a value policy? Well, it's one of the exceptions. A value policy is when we know how much is going to pay out or how much is going to be paid out upon loss. So indemnification value is set. It's in the policy. There's no estimation after the fact. There could be estimation prior, an, an agreement prior, but after the fact. And a quick note here, really, we could just put life insurance under value policies. They are mostly a type of value policies. Okay. So antiques, heirlooms are those would be pretty good examples of, of when a value policy would work. And then again, life insurance policies fit with that. Now, what I want to do here with the replacement cost insurance, sometimes, if there's if we're looking at it from an accounting perspective, that asset could be worth more on the market than it is on books. Or the other way around. Even with depreciation, it could be that it's overvalued. The market value is lower. So that could really break indemnity, right? If we, as the insurance company, pay the book value okay, as opposed to the market value, if the market value is lower, then we broke the principle of identification. And it's not uncommon for things for the book to market ratio of something to not be one to one. It's not uncommon for book to market ratios to be to not be a one to one ratio. Okay, now, insurable interest, something else that we've already kind of dipped our toes in for this semester. And we'll, we'll, so let's dive into it a little more, or at least with the lens of um, legal principles in our minds, the legality of all this from a contractual standpoint. So those, those are the lens we're putting on when we're looking at insurable interest today. Okay. So a quick reminder, one way that we you know, look at this is say, all right, the policyholder or the insured must be in a position to lose within that contract. So again, we use credit default swaps. If I'm the outside investor buying a credit default swap, but let's say that bond, if it's a bond default that I'm buying the credit default swap on, if I don't hold that bond, then I don't have any insurable interest. In fact, I want it to fail so that I get a payout. That's, that's not insurance. Why? Well, what I just explained is more, you know, taking on a financial risk rather than a risk transfer. And it's also speculative, so it's not a pure risk. And we know that insurance contracts ideally deal in pure risk, not financial risk. So we don't want to see gambling. And we want to reduce moral hazard. Now, a strange little addendum here. There's, there's some, some things called, or um, there are certain contracts in life insurance called STOLES, so stranger owned life insurance. So it's not illegal in most states, it's not illegal to purchase a life insurance policy for, for someone else, essentially. Common examples, let's say there's a large firm and they're worried about their CEO's health, or they're worried if something happens to their CEO, What's that going to do to their, let's say, market value? Probably doesn't help it. So what they'll do is they'll take out a life insurance policy to name the firm as a beneficiary if their CEO passes. Now, generally speaking, once he or she leaves, you can assign the contract to them, and it's, it's kind of theirs. And, you know, they can give the charity. So when they pass away, it pays out the charity or their kids. So when do we require this? Well, it's different for property and life. For property insurance, it has to be at the time of the loss. So if I own, say I own a business and I have an actual kind of brick and mortar store, I sell you that business and the store okay, and the building. I can't then go and claim loss if something happens to the building that burns down. Why? Because maybe I'm the one that burned it down. 
So at the time of loss, it doesn't matter if I've been paying premiums, which would be a bit silly, but it doesn't matter if I've been paying premiums because I don't stand to lose in that scenario. So that again, we have moral hazard. Very common element in contracts like this when risk is being shifted and we have asymmetric information. Now, you could purchase that contract or at least agree to that contract prior to owning. That would be fine. But the important part is that it has to be at the time of the loss. Conversely, with life insurance contract, it's just at the time of the purchase. So a problem could arise, let's say, if an individual names their spouse and then they get a divorce and maybe they don't want their divorced you know, husband or wife being the beneficiary. Well, they would have to change that. So it's not necessary upon the, the loss on the person of the contract. Okay. Now, something new to us, well, perhaps, at least new as far as discussions in this classroom. And that's the principle of subrogation. Okay. So the insurer is going to take, you know, kind of go up to bat for you is one way to look at it. It's not all positive, but they're going to go up to bat for you. They're going to act on your behalf. So when, when this is not, or when this is positive, is let's say that you're hit, you know, you're driving and someone hits you, uh, it's your fault. You don't have to go after that other person or go through their insurance directly to be reimbursed or indemnified for your loss. That doesn't mean you, you will never have to contact them, but if problems arise, it's on your insurance company to deal with any you know lapse in payments or, or kind of the, the other companies dragging their feet, so to speak. So your insurance company, you're, they will pay you and then go after debt to collect damages from the guilty party. And it could be through the guilty party's insurance. Guilty sounds a little harsh, but it's, it's I think, correct here. The at-fault party, that's a better way to put it. So again, it's after the payment of loss. Now, when could this be bad? Well, let's look at um, maybe a malpractice suit. So one thing, you know, one of the big expenses for, for doctors tend to be mal malpractice insurance, um, chiefly because malpractice suits, the risk that that insurance cover, covers are in very, very, very expensive. So it could be that the doctor is paying for malpractice insurance, they're sued, and the insurance company might want to settle out of court. Maybe it's cheaper. Okay, from maybe a, a simple MPD perspective, that might be better, save us some money, save us some time. However, from a marketing perspective or a branding perspective, when you settle out of court, what does the general public assume? Does the general public assume that you're innocent if you settle out of court, or do they assume that you're guilty, usually? Usually they assume that you're guilty, right? So the doctor might know that and not want that kind of stain on his or her record, whether there's fault or not. So it's not always perfect. But the idea is to correct for what could be double collecting. And that's on the next slide. So an example of what we want to try to lessen or mitigate, if not completely circumvent. Let's say that your neighbor, they're burning some leaves, it's fall, leaves are falling. They're burning leaves, and then that fire damages your house. You have homeowners, they have homeowners. Those two insurance companies, or if it's the same one, but they will go to bat, it'll kind of happen on the periphery and then you'll be reimbursed, okay, assuming it's a covered loss, it almost always is. You'll be reimbursed, it's not your fault, your neighbor's insurance might be higher next year, the homeowner's might be higher, okay, if they're considered at fault. What we don't want you to do is to then go back and sue your neighbor. You've already been indemnified. So we, this kind of goes back to indemnification, we don't want you double collected. In reducing moral hazard and reducing unnecessary payouts reduces overall losses in the pool, overall claims payouts, therefore reducing premiums. So that's good. 
good for the market. Still, those who are at fault are held accountable. And then we have this double collecting that, that I mentioned. Now again, utmost good faith, and I think I use the word arcane or archaic to describe this idea. That doesn't mean necessarily mean it's negative, okay? It's just, you know, when we go through this, we'll say, well, of course, any contract should work this way. Okay? But the reason we see the principle of utmost good faith is because in the infancy of what we would now consider insurance contracts, the primary contract was for ships sailing across the Atlantic. And we're talking two, three, four hundred years ago. Where if we get, let's say we go from port to port, I, really, I don't know how long that would take back then. But it would take longer than today. If we go from port to port, we could say that there's a loss. We lost all our cargo. Pirates or something more exciting. Very difficult to dispute that as the insurance company if you don't have offices in the new world, in the states. So due to that high degree of information asymmetry, right, because there's not, there's no way someone can just go and take a picture. There's no RFID tag. Even if you could verify it, how long is it going to take them to know? It has to go back across the Atlantic. So there's a high degree of information asymmetry. There's also even kind of a log jam that's created, a bottleneck, due to the time constraint of getting information across. So since there's a high degree of information asymmetry, there's a high degree of trust on both parties. Now, some elements of this could be prior to the contract. So we could see this in an application setup as well. One is what we call material misrepresentation. So representation, what we mean here, statements made on the application. A material misrepresentation is one that's so egregious that the insurance company never would have given you the contract to begin with. or would have drastically changed the contract. You say you don't smoke, but you smoke a pack a day. That affects your overall health and your life expectancy. So health insurers and life insurers want to know that. If they are, again, to use the word egregious enough, the contract could be void. Now, other things in utmost good faith, there's also concealment. Hiding certain loss exposures. You know that the front steps of your business get a little slippery. So when the underwriter comes out to assess you know, your liability, you make sure they come out on a nice sunny day and you draw off those front steps. Okay. Could be concealment. Now a warranty is an addendum in which one party, generally the insured, agrees to uphold some additional, let's say, part of the contract, usually to reduce their premiums. So they agree to install new, um, new steps or put an awning over the steps so that when it rains, they don't get that slippery. Their premiums could be low. If you break a warranty, it, could, it is also considered a type of misrepresentation. So warranty is an addendum. Now, what do we require legally for an insurance contract? Okay. Well, there has to be acceptance for both parties, obviously. The two parties, oftentimes in nomenclatures, we have the insured and the insurer. So the insured would be the policyholder. The insurer is the firm taking on the risk, the insurance company. So. Now, the two big parts of this, once you've identified Okay, they agree, 
who's insured, who's insurer. Two things to be mindful of. The parties have to be competent. So legal consenting age, sound mind. If you're inebriated and sign a contract, most states would not count that. Many, if not all. Not held liable in that case. So they have to be competent parties. And then the risk, the loss exposure, has to be a legal loss exposure. It has to be for a legal purpose. So if your meth lab explodes, your homeowner's policy is probably not going to pay out for that. You can't get business income insurance on your side meth hustle. be a hard sell. Now, when we see something a little, so to be a little less cavalier about it and something that we can actually see now, let's say that you operate a marijuana dispensary. Plenty of states, that's fine. Okay, plenty of states, that's fine. But the federal level, as of right now, it's not a legal purpose. So we know that insurance companies are regulated on the state level, so we could say, all right, they could do that. And in fact, there is in the surplus lines, we do see some coverage for, for cannabis or uh, THC marijuana dispensaries. In fact, one of the firms is called Canisher. Pretty sure they're still around so a few years ago. So you say, all right, well, state level, this is fine. But let's say that Canisher, they're taking in these premiums. You know, we'll consider this a surplus line. So it's kind of a specialty product, obviously. They're taking in these premiums, and let's say they earn them, they have some cash flow. Are they just taking their, does any firm just take their money and put it all, stuff it all in petty cash? No. What do I do with my money if I'm not investing it and I want to hold cash? I go and put it in the bank. If I put that money in the bank, are banks regulated at the state or federal level? Federal. Now, there, there are some state stipulations. But now what's happened, the money that I, as the insurance company, am depositing is from something that's federally not legal. So that could rise some problems. You could say, well, maybe I could look at a state credit union. Ah, but they're still regulated by the Fed, too. There's something pretty interesting. And I think I've had students before in the past uh, write their uh, final paper about, you know, uh, insuring, you know, marijuana dispensaries or something like that. So that'd be a pretty interesting topic. You should be able to find plenty about that. So if you're kind of thinking ahead for the, the final, which is a uh, you know, current events assignment, that could be pretty interesting. Yeah, there's a lot to write about there. Okay. All right. And on that happy note, any questions on Chapter 9?